are recording for episode 14 of the Smart B Sports Update podcast with Dan and John. Perfect. <laughs> yes. How you been, man? Good, thanks, mate. Yourself? I've been fantastic. I'm very yep. excited for the Cricket World Cup. Yep. Drank uh, my, um, my jersey out of yeah, the cup. Yeah, you're showing your colours. Good to see. Um, we had some. St- of course, we've still got NRL and AFL news going on. There's a of bunch of nonsense yep, happening. But we there. sort of dusted ourselves off from the season and. Uh, Looking forward to the Cricket World Cup, John. Yeah, but um, we'll just touch on that first because the uh, NRL and the AFL first, I guess, because then we'll yeah. get into the Cricket World Cup and I think that'll be a deep one. Um, yeah, I saw you got um, Kiwis and Samoa on the rundown here, John. Did you want me to start with a bit of Aussie news first? Oh, yeah, go for it, yeah. Yeah, so Nathan Cleary, unfortunately for Australia, John, ahead of the Pacific Championship, he's been ruled out of the Kangaroo squad with a knee injury. So Nico Hines takes his place in the 21-man squad. Did um, Caelan Ponga, like, punch Melman in his mum or something? <laughs> what does Caelan Ponga have to do to get a call up? Yeah, something's, uh, something's <laughs> happened there. But a good turnaround for Nico, though, John, after he was dropped from the New South Wales Origin team. Um, but this basically just hands that number seven jumper to DCE yeah. now, John. Well, he's, he's, like, to be honest, DCE is the best rep um, halfback we have. Mm. Uh, Nathan Cleary is probably the best halfback obviously mm. but he's never been really the best rep halfback um, and so DC has shown time and time again for years and years and years that he is actually like a quality high quality in all the big games so I, I thought he actually to be honest I thought he should have gotten the um, would should get the number seven ahead of Nathan Cleary for Australia anyway yeah really I can't. Yeah, just because he's, he's DC like he won state it's not his fault that Manly sucked well, it's, it's not. Um, it's not. That, that, that's true, John. But I, I, I just, I wouldn't have been able to go past Cleary after the grand final. But um, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Obviously, you know, it's a pretty handy replacement to yeah. have for for, um, for Cleary in DCE. But um, you know, yeah, there you go, John. Don't know Ponga. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so that injury to Cleary, John, a Payne Haas, a tackle from Payne Haas in the grand finals, believed to have caused the injury. I think it might have been a hip drop tackle. It's an MCL injury for Cleary. Haas was fined a thousand dollars by the match review committee, and Australia's first game will be against Samoa on Oct- October fourteen. Yep, and uh, Samoa has named their team. They've got yep. six Premiership players in it, um, with yep. Crichton, Spencer Lenu, Isaac Targo, and Brian Toto from the Panthers, and Keenan Palacio. Yeah, six grand final players. Yeah, yeah sorry, Palacio. Yes, grand final players. And Keenan Palacio and Jesse Arthurs from Broncos. Yep. Um, I, 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 in their, their team, I couldn't really find, put together a, a world-class spine, to be honest. Um, I went through this. I'm not going to go through this whole squad, but uh, obviously Jerome Luai's out. Um, they don't really have a 1, 6, 7 and 9 that mm. you can compare to Australia or New Zealand. Yeah, um, they're, they're still just that little bit of a way behind um, the Aussies and the Kiwis. But, you know, I guess what we're starting to have expectations of the likes of um, Samoa, aren't we now, John? Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, you know I'm, I'm very hopeful that they'll have a good tournament. Yeah, Steve, led by Stephen Crichton there. Spencer Lenny, we've talked about him plenty of times on this podcast. He's no slouch. Isaac Tago got injured in the grand final, but hope it seems like he's dusted up okay. Brian Toto, what a year of try scoring he had with the Panthers. Um, yeah, and Keenan Palacio, Jesse Arthurs, as you said, two other grand final players there. Um, yeah. It's a handy squad, and you know, yeah, we're expecting big things from the Samoa. Their forwards look good, their backs look good, but yeah, just I think their spine is going to let them down. Um, on the flip side, with the Kiwis, uh, at the time I had mm. looked, I don't know if PNG, Fiji, and Cook Island have actually named their squad yet, but uh, Kiwis have named seven debutants. Yep. Uh, and Sean Johnson's out, so Jerome Hughes and Dylan Brown will be the halves. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a big blow, I think, for the Kiwis. Big blow, yeah. Um... Joey Manu and uh, Sean's Nickel Cox, that'll be the options at fullback there, John. Yeah. So no shortage of fullback options. Those um, potential debutants you mentioned, so Knights duo Far Manu Brown and Leo Thompson, along with Warimu Greg, Keanu Kinney, Griffin Neem, Matt Tomoko and Nafau White. So that's a lot of uh, potential debutants there yeah. for the Kiwis, John. Um, and... They, they haven't named 
like a world class rep hooker in the squad. I noticed either they do have Kieran Foran, Danny Levi, and New Brown, who can play the hooker spot. Mm. But um, uh, you know, with Sean Johnson out, they really wanted like like the Kiwis no longer have like an Isaac Luke there that can step in. Unfortunately, for I don't mean to be a like a world class hooker. So I, don't I, know, think the Kiwis, four, I think Foran would do a good job there. Yeah, he's they a, could he's certainly a do a job. Strong there. man. That's the thing yeah. about Kieran Foran. He'll get through his strong. defense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think he'd. I'd I'd be inclined to give him the number nine jumper. Job. Yeah. Well, given his experience. Yeah. In the Kiwi pack and everything, but and then you know, strength of the Kiwis, their forward pack <laughs> is ridiculous when you read out the mm. names. Yeah. James Fisher Harris. Moses Leota, Nelson Asafa Salomona, Joseph Tapanay, Brian Nicara, and Isaiah Papali. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going up against yeah. him, John. <laughs> That's like 12,000 kilos <laughs> running at the, their, their opponents. And they're going to be playing... So they're not playing in the first week, actually, are they? No, they play the following week. Um, they, they're going to play Samoa on October 21st. Mm. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate for Nathan Cleary... But yeah, you know, New Zealand didn't yeah. make the World Cup final last last year. Last year it was Tonga. Yeah. Uh, Tonga's off to play England as well. Mm-hmm. So there's some other internationals going on. I think a lot of them you have to watch on KO. Uh, obviously, there's nothing on Channel Nine or anything like that because, uh, to be honest, not many people care about international rugby league. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it would be Fox League. Yeah, Fox League will do it. Yeah. yeah um, and KO. Yeah. That- yeah. It's, you know, we've been starved of international football. Um, I know we had the World Cup last year. Before that, with the pandemic, obviously international football fell by the wayside. So um, it's nice to see these internationals on the calendar. I mean, as I said before, Australia's first match will be against Samoa on October 14. Yeah, yeah so. so I'm sure Australia will win that handily. Um, in other and I so that's we got nothing really much in rugby league until next week when the yeah when those kick, games get underway kick off and we'll probably have a big preview show next week for that actually yeah um, but in other news so you see this news about Souths um, they re-signed Jason Dimitri for a further three years yeah I, I think it, I think it's they gave him two I think he was well, he was under contract for twenty four and they've given him twenty five and twenty six so it's three years from now. I think it was two years added to the um, existing uh, contract. Existing contract there, My understanding yeah, so. is it was after a review of the year as well. So Yeah, I don't get it. Um, um, so thinking about him, okay, since he's taken over, he's been there for since 2022, okay? In 2021, the Rabbitohs made the grand final and then they lost to Panthers. Mm. 2022, they came seventh. In 2023, they missed the eighth. Mm. So under Jason Demetrius' uh, coaching, they have gotten steadily worse, and then they've added him for an extra two years. Mm. Now, um, people did blame, uh, try and blame rep football for their slide when they, they, you know, what was it, after round 11, they were first. Yeah, yeah, well, first on the ladder after 11 rounds, then only won four of their last 13 games and missed the eighth. So they, they didn't have a massive amount of players, to mm. be honest, in rep football, so it wasn't rep football. But like Damien Cook and I think, uh, what's his name? Keon, I'm not even going to try. Is it Colin Matungi? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, Cam Murray and Cody Walker. But they were mainly across games as well. It wasn't mm. like a stack of players were out during the mm. rep season. And even if you want to blame rep seasons, mm. you look at something like the Panthers that had like seven players. Mm. Name managed to come first. Yeah. But under his leadership, they have gotten steadily worse. Yeah. And they have more off-field drama this week with mm. Latrell Mitchell, which to me is a non-event. Uh, Latrell declared himself unavailable to play for Australia, then went and played in the Koori Knockout Cup. Yeah, yeah. Man, there's a big outcry about it. But if you yeah. think that playing for Australia is the same as playing for the Koori Knockout Cup, mm. you are mad. Yeah. Like, absolutely <laughs> insane. Yeah, I was just going to touch on Demetria before we move on to Latrell, John. Um, yeah, I what I would have done... I think what's happened is South have looked at it and gone, well, we, we don't want this to drag into 2024, not knowing who our 2025 coach is. So we want to get him We want to get him locked away for a further two years to quell that media speculation. But what I would have just done is just come out and say, look, we're going to put the decision on hold until the end of the 2024 season. I know these clubs are obsessed with, oh, we've got to look stable for recruitment. 
purposes. What, what do they think is going to happen, John? What they think they're going to sign Nathan Cleary or something? <laughs> I mean, it's it's not going to happen, you know. Well, that they, they've got to just look at it and go. Well, Demetrio is an unproven coach, so he needs more time to prove himself. In his case, he had a year left on his contract. Give him that year, see how he goes. Don't rush into re-signing him until the end of twenty twenty six. Yeah, and even the stability thing. So, if they go worse next year. They're not going to be able to attract players even if they do know who their coach is. And exactly. And how bad is it going to look if they, they've, they've re-signed him and if he, he missed the eight this year? How bad is it going to look if they bomb out again next or year? Or if they're like, you know, running 15th or 16th or 17th next year, they're not going to be able to attract players. They're going to have to sack him. They're going to have to pay him out. It, that's the same as the Adam O'Brien situation. Like, people need to... I think clubs really need to take a little bit of a step back and understand, even then, like... We discussed it before where you start making your signatures now, even your plans for like 2024, 2025, 2026 mm. after 1st of November. Mm. But you can make your plans anyway because I think players are now of the yeah. understanding that even if you look at Ben Hunt, even yeah. if you sign the coach and want a contract that says you stay there with the coach, your coach might not be there. Yeah. Um, and so it is, I thought it was really crazy when I read it and then followed up by the Latrell Mitchell think- thing, which kind of compounded it. It's like under Jason Demetrius coaching, Rabbitohs have gotten worse. They've had a stack of off-field drama with uh, you know, favoritism issues. And then there's another thing in the in the media about like the Rabbitohs favoriting favor showing favorites to Latrell Mitchell. Again, I think it's a non-event the whole favoritism thing, but even doing that is it compounds the issue that they have with Jason Demetrius mm, yeah. and the Rabbitohs in general. Um, if they hadn't have signed Demetrio and Latrell playing in the Curry Cup, I think that would have been a non-event. You know, that's the thing. They're like, I think the fact that they became stories, they're intrinsically linked. They signed Demetrio, who's performed pretty badly, you'd have to say, who had a whole bunch of issues with, like, in the media and off for dramas with Latrell Mitchell and favouritism issues. And then Latrell Mitchell, even though he's injured, is allowed to play in a uh, lower, like a, another competition. Yeah, um, yeah. With Demetrio, I mean, he did make the prelim finals in twenty twenty two. After yeah, they came, came seventh, they did come seventh, and then he did get them into the prelims. But as we say, this year was was a, was a terrible year for South. So f- finished just horribly. Um, yeah, I just you know, it's just. Oh, it's, it's just bizarre to me, John. I mean, t- two more years. That's the thing. There's no perfect scenario here, is there? I think the clubs go too far with the let's lock everything down, let's be secure for recruitment purposes. Um, you know, he's the, the fact is he's an unproven coach. You can't re-sign an unproven coach. If it was Craig Bellamy, um, if it was Wayne Bennett, if it was Trent Robinson, if it was a proven coach, Ivan Cleary, <laughs> you give him the extra two years, but he's not in that category. He's unproven. He needs to prove himself. So it's the wrong decision. And now we get to Latrell Mitchell. Yeah. Um, it's very... <laughs> yeah, pulling out of the kangaroo um, squad for a finger injury um, and then playing in the Koori knockout... Very, very interesting to me, John. Very interesting. I, I, I think uh, the Curry knockout competition is very important to a lot of the. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm I not. Um, I'm not, not devaluing like, the. From importance what I of understand is Latrell pulled out. Like I can only know what I read, but Latrell pulled out of the Curry knockout. I mean, of the Australian squad, at the advice of the Rabbitohs uh, medical staff, not because he didn't want to play. Now, that could be just taking that cover for him, right? You, know, you never know. But then the fact that he was allowed to play by the Rabbitohs medical staff for the Korean knockout, for something that's so important to him, mm. kind of shows that whole favouritism kind of... Do you think, um, you know, if the... If, I don't know any of the other Indigenous boys that are in the Rabbitohs off the top of my head, but you have to think if there was someone in the same situation... Well, Jack White now, now that he's going there, if he counts as a Rabbitohs player... Yeah, so... If he was in the same situation in which... Well, he's a star player too. So it's like a non-star player. If you had a non-star player who was going to make their debut for Australia and the, staff, the medical staff said, no, we don't think you could, should, would he then be allowed to go play in the Curry knockout competition? You just don't know. You don't know what the actual situation is no matter what you read. But because of the issues they've had this mm. year with favouritism, 
well, like supposed favoritism, Sam Burgess leaving and stuff like that, it does make it a massive story, mm. you know? Um, I think Latrell needs to realise that, okay, n- none of us, we know the importance of the Curry knockout competition, yeah. John, it's a great competition. We're certainly not devaluing the importance of that when we're, or when I'm saying this, I'm not devaluing the importance of that. But what Latrell needs to realise is that if he pulls out of the kangaroo squad with a finger injury and then in the interim, in the meantime, goes and plays in another competition, putting to one side the importance of it for now, people are going to question that. They yeah, are. And, and if they question that, it doesn't mean that they've got it in for him. It doesn't mean that they've got an agenda against him. He needs to realise that it doesn't look good. Yeah, and it it's, it wouldn't have looked good as it was. No. Compounded on the back of everything that happened no. over the last two months. It's just yeah. always going to be... You know, I, I, you have this thing when you have, like, kids at school that have trouble, right? And yes. You, you have to say to them, you have to be extra careful now mm. because you've had a lot of trouble. You've got to be extra careful now because every small thing you do will be compounded heaps. Yep. And that's what they really need to sit down and tell a trell. Mm. You've had a lot of trouble with off-field favouritism issues or whatever, okay? Mm. So now you've got to be extra careful with every one of your decisions. This, this is Because every John. small thing you do is right. going to blow up. This is the thing, John. A great event, the Curry Knockout. Great event. Yeah. But if Luttrell just doesn't play in it one year because he's out injured, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, it's John. nothing. The, the, world, the world moves on. The what world what it would have turns. been was a buy note. Unfortunately, Luttrell Mitchell was unable to play because of his finger injury. <laughs> and, and, and who would have, if he had just said, look, guys, if he had gone to the, the Curry knockout comp and said, look, guys, I pulled out of the kangaroo side, I got a finger injury, you know, I, I'm out this year. They yeah. would have just said, "Yeah, no worries, no, Latrell. Yeah. Come, come down, yeah, come, come down, and come down and watch it. Um, come and be part of it and everything. But just sit it out. You know, um, he could help with the coaching staff. His expertise on the game would be more than welcome on the coaching staff. He could have helped out in other ways, but he's decided to play, and this has blown up. And he needs to real. He needs to. He he just needs to be a lot a, a bit more sort of self aware of his yeah, actions. Exactly. Sometimes. It's and he's in that situation where he's the naughty kid, and no matter what he does, no matter how small it is, yeah, it's it's gonna blow. I, up. I, I just don't want to hear him come out and say, "Oh, this person, you know, this person's got it in for me," or these people have got a gen. Like, no, no, Latrell, no. There's there's valid reason to question yeah, what's going exactly. on. Exactly. Um, so apparently it was a good event. That Ado Car apparently got knocked out as well. Yeah, he did. And I, I did. I did. Watch, I don't know if you watched any of it, John. No, but I just I, saw the headlines. I, I watched a little bit of it the day after Grand Final Day. I went through a few postseason withdrawal symptoms, and I, as we do, and um, I flicked it on, and um, yeah, Ben Barber was playing in it, John. Oh wow! It was good to see him yeah. getting out, having a run again, and as I said before, Jack White and. Him and Bar, I can't remember the name of the team, forgive me, but him and Barber were playing on the same team. Oh, they looked very sharp together too, a, um, John. That's a le- legit backline. Yeah, that's, that's not, not a bad backline <laughs> at all to have, John. Um, um, yeah. uh, one other thing on this Latrell story, John, and I know this is not a politics podcast, and I don't, I'm not going to... We can I'm, make it. Everything's I'm, political I'm, I'm, these I'm, days, I'm man. I'm not about to turn it into one. <laughs> Everything is political. And, I'm, and again, I have no political persuasion, John. I'm... I'm apolitical. I, I, I'm not interested in any of it. But I noticed Anthony Albanese, of all people, took it upon himself to defend Latrell Mitchell in this storm of criticism. I would have thought, Albo, just just stick to the politics What's there, mate. And he tried to drag... You, he tried to... He tried to even drag the voice referendum into all this, if you can believe that. Well, that'd that. be why. Um, yeah, that, that'd be why. But it's just, you know what I mean? You just look at that, John. You go, come on, Elbo, just just give it a rest, mate. You yeah, know? I, don't, I don't think it was... Uh, he can have an opinion. We've discussed before. He's entitled to his opinion. But there he are some, he has other again. I'm no Peter Dutton yeah. supporter, John. But I just thought I should. Look, you are a right wing nut job, all right? <laughs> <laughs> give me back our guns or whatever the hell you people say. <laughs> You're not taking our guns. We're I just, I just now. saw that, John. And I was like, yeah, I'm adding that to my notes, yeah, John. Like, uh, yeah. But that, that that again just shows highlights exactly where Latrell Mitchell is at. Like everything he does is gonna blow up. So he has to be extra, extra, extra mm. careful, and that's it. Um, Hopefully we don't see any more Latrell Mitchell stories for the next six weeks. He can go away and... Yeah. Um, I think he just needs to cool his heels over the course of the off-season. Just, you know, maybe reflect on a few things from this year. 
And we all want to see him come back fit and healthy and have a great season for South next year. And carve up for New South Wales. Yeah, yeah exactly. We want to see him do well at um, club level next year, state level, and hopefully next year, John, hopefully if the Kangaroos have got tests next year, I'm not sure if they do or I don't not. Know. If they do, I'd love to see him back in a kangaroos jumper. Well, I want to. We can segue into New South Wales because apparently, uh, yes. Well, Ricky Stewart's turned down the job. I, did they actually offer it to him? Because if they offered it to them, yeah. to him, I so, just it crushed so, my soul. Yeah. So, um, so just on that, John. Um, to all of Ricky Stewart's mates in the media, and there are a lot of them. Oh yeah. That he's must have been very good to a lot of people in the media, John, because they certainly look after him. I got a little message for those people. It's okay, you don't have to pretend like you think he should get the origin coaching job anymore. He's pulled out of the race, okay? Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, we don't... Yeah. He, was, he never should have got it. And yeah. Anybody who says he is, he's, he's a, just yeah. exactly doing exactly what he's saying. But Laurie Daly is being looked at for New South Wales. Yeah. Now, you know, we discuss it. So the, the whole thing is, like, he's got unfinished business. He, he won a, a series, right? With, so, um, yeah, so he was New South Wales coach between 27... Sorry... Between 2013 and 2017, John, won one series out of five in 2014. Yeah, so and he was, was Brad um, Fittler's predecessor. So it was, uh, he was, it was with um, Trent Hodkinson and Josh Reynolds. Josh Reynolds in the yeah. halves, the Bulldogs <laughs> halves combination. One were the only ones in a 12 year uh, period to win an Origin yeah. series, John. But, um, but yeah, I mean, surely we're not, we're not going back to. And Laurie Daly was a great New South Wales player, one of the best of all time. But we're not going to go back to him as coach, John. He won one series out of five, yeah. and he was there before Fittler was. So why, um, why why would people suggest that Laurie Daly should be the coach? Because uh, when, when they know all this stuff. There's nobody. There's no. I'll, I'll tell you what I would do, John. Uh, again, if I'm critical of the Laurie Daly idea, then I have to come up with an alternative, mm-hmm. and I've done that. So what I would do is I would make Nathan... Sorry, Nathan. Ivan... I would make <laughs> Ivan Cleary the New South... Oh, maybe Nathan could captain coach. No, I'm joking. No, no, no. Um, I'd make Ivan Cleary the coach of New South Wales. I'd make him an offer that he can't refuse. I'd give him as long as he wants. I'd give him a part-time deal that he can just do around his Penrith gig. That's my idea, John. That's what I've... Since you brought it up on Tuesday, I've had a bit more time to think about it. That's what I would do. What so do you reckon? I reckon him as the coach with the ability, like I said, part-time. He's got stuff to do. He's going to go for a full Yeah, week. he does, yeah. If he could hire full-time other people to to do the other things that a full-time coach does. i I got no idea what a full-time state of origin coach does, but I know that you, uh, Queens, it's successful for Queensland. And so obviously whatever Mal Meninga before him and now Billy Slater does is successful. If he has people who can do that work and report back to him, then it would be a good idea. But, uh, like... And he might, they, they might be able to get that arrangement yeah, in place. Yeah, get Mary, Mary McGregor back. I don't know if Mary McGregor was useful at all. Um, okay, so that so that's my alternative, John. So if, if Ivan Cleary is allowed to do it part-time, like, as used to happen, club coaches used to coach origin teams all the, t- all the time. Wayne Bennett did it for years. Mm. If it's part time, I'm going with Ivan Cleary. If it's full time, I'm going Mary McGregor. Either way, I think we need a new option. I don't. Well, Ricky Stewart's ruled out yeah. himself out. Thank God. I don't think they can go back to Craig Bellamy. I don't think they can go back to Laurie Daly. It's got to be someone who hasn't done it before, taking New South Wales in a new direction. Yeah, I was, the other one that I was um, thinking possibly uh, is Denny Badiris. Um, he was one of the assistant coaches. Uh, who was you know now they have zero yeah, coaches. I mean that's not a bad idea because as um, you said the Johns brothers. As long as do no it. matter who they get though, I think Ivan Cleary has to be there in some capacity. Uh, so bare minimum, Ivan Cleary sits in the coach's box on match nine. Yeah, but you yeah. know he, obviously the whoever the coach is needs to be able to call him and ask him for feedback, questions, stuff like that. Like. You know, he, Ivan Cleary's pretty young as well, so it's a bit weird. Because when you say, like, you know... Yeah, I looked have, him up last night. He's 52 years like, old. Yeah, you have a coaching mentor. You would think a coaching mentor is, like, 130, like Wayne Bennett. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, as long as whoever goes in there has someone like, and you know, uh, off the top of my head, only Ivan Cleary. Maybe Trent Robinson. Is Trent Robinson a New South Welshman? Um, I think so, John. I yeah, think so, he is. Those yeah. kind of guys who are actually the modern-day super coaches who can help. And then, yes, Ivan Cleary has to be there at the... 
um, in the actual games, um, then that'll be okay. But what they're doing now is just more typical New South Wales, 10 years in a row for Queensland winning type stuff. And we don't want to see that. We want it to be competitive. That, that, that's the frustrating thing, John, from a New South Wales point of view. Obviously, you had Queensland winning 11 out of 12 between 2006 and 2017. But it's years like... It's years like, I mean, at least at that time you could go, well, look at all the great players yeah. Queensland have, but it's years like 2020 that just do your head in, John, because a number of reporters were saying that this is the worst Queensland team of all time. That's, and they still won. That's so, what drives New South Wales supporters mad, John. Twice in the history of uh, State of Origin I can remember there being the worst Queensland team of all time. And both times Queensland won. So I just wish reporters would never yeah, say that again. Yeah, just don't say it. Just don't, don't, don't do it to <laughs> us anymore. Yeah. Just please, Looking at the statistical please, analyses please, of please this. Stop. If I was to do a future prediction for the next worst Queensland team of all time, 100% of the time they win. <laughs> And like you know, there was the year they bagged Adam Mogg, and then he because like um, uh, Mal Meninga picked Adam Mogg from Canberra, and then the media, New South Wales uh, media, I remember the headline was like Adam Who, and then he scored two tries and just carved <laughs> us up. Like just, just don't bag him, man. <laughs> like, so yeah, like God, well, State of Origin is going to be the gift that keeps on giving to keep us talking about. That's the thing; league. they're giving us something to talk yeah, about here we'll in keep the rugby league season, in our minds for the next six months. Um, yep. It always is. With we'll New keep South Wales. Uh, covering it very closely. But Don't worry about a that. Bunch of nonsense going on over in the mm. AFL, which mm. does a little bit happen every year. Um, one of the things is that's come out like that's everywhere is the Clayton Oliver situation. Yeah, I have. Uh, I have taken some notes. So one I thing think. I saw about this, which is, is one of, there was somebody on Reddit created a fake news story. Mm. And then one of the news media's ran with it. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> so so John, does that mean that the whole idea that he was going to be traded was just no, no? There's still this though. That may or may not be true, but it wasn't that fake news story. It was. Oh, was I it think some it was other um, story that you're not that he was to... going to? No, I think it was he was going to. Who came last? Kangaroos, right? Was it? And West Coast came second last. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, so it? the fake news story was that West Coast had definitely gotten his signature and one of the news media, news organisations, ran with this story. So all the stuff coming out in the news can just... As I was reading the thread on Reddit. It's hilarious. Like, dudes, they copied my story. <laughs> <laughs> I made that up, guys. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there is... So Clayton Oliver, he signed this year, from what I understand, yeah, for seven years. AFL on their long-term contracts. Seven years, a million dollars a season. Seven million dollars, yep. Um, but Melbourne are now open to letting him go. And he's been shopped around and been told basically like other clubs are able to buy him. Yeah, he, he's a four-time best and fairest winner with the Demons job. Um, he's a gun midfielder, played in their 2021 premiership. And I, as I understand it, John, that seven-year, seven million dollar contract hasn't even started yet. I it think is. it starts... Next year. That's a bizarre. So one of the again, like you can't guarantee anything because it could all just become from made up. Hasn't Reddit even crap. started a seven million dollar seven year deal, and they want to trade him. What? So one of the rumors that I read it was because it was the first this year was the first time ever that he was injured for an extended period. He was injured for ten weeks, and he didn't handle his injury and recovery very well. And the club were very unhappy with his behavior, and no longer think he is a viable. Melbourne demon has the right um, attitude or whatever, right? Again, can't guarantee it. You don't know it's true. Somebody could have made it up on Reddit. It mm-hmm. could be made up on 4chan. But it's still the situation in itself, the fact that it's been confirmed by a Melbourne as far as I can understand, um, that, yes, they are open to him leaving, but they've signed a, a contract that hasn't started yet for $7 million for one of the best players in the league. <laughs> and... Um, one of the things, the suggestions that I saw was maybe it's because they are trying to find a very, very high value forward. Because uh, he's a midfielder, yeah? Mm. And one of their issues all year was that they couldn't convert points. Their midfield was very good, but their forward what forward yes, weren't. Yes, that's true. Which is something you called it's earlier, true, that they yes, need to go and true. throw a lot of money at some forwards out there. That was one of the suggestions I saw. Of, like, I, I like to get my news from the news and then I read the conversations on the, the Reddit and Instagram and stuff mm. like that. This is one but of I, the suggestions. I, I would have thought you, you just go and, um, 
and replace forwards with forwards, don't you? Don't go and trade your, your gun midfielder yeah, to get that's forwards. The, in, that that anyway. was, so that was the ongoing conversation. They're like, why would they get rid of him? It's like, and it was because overall their midfield was very like very good, but their best player in midfield. Getting like, rid of your best midfielder to improve your forward line. I mean, that's like robbing Peter to pay Paul, isn't it? So yeah, this is the weird thing. But the rest of their midfields are still quite good. Mm. Uh, obviously, he is their best, and then. It is not the right... Well, in theory, it's not the right thing to do because your midfield, which was your best section in mm. the whole year, becomes suddenly very much mm. worse mm. for a potential improvement that you have to build on up front. Well, well, John, I know um, Melbourne legend Gary Lyon, he's not happy with this development at all. He said he's, quote, horrified at the thought that the Demons would even contemplate trading Oliver. It's crazy. So there you it's go. so bizarre. It's such a bizarre yeah. situation. Um, yeah, I'm with Gary on that one, John. I've um. There's also you know North Melbourne. Um, mm-hmm. They've sucked basically all their coaching staff except for the head coach. They had yeah. to do something. <laughs> <laughs> they're hiring a bunch of um assistant coaches. Yeah. I, I believe from like Brisbane, um, stuff like that. Guys who are now the the. One I can't. Far out. I always forget to write names down. Right, the one they they're bringing in from Brisbane. I got the the guess on the internet the other day that was um he's totally coming in to be the replacement. They're going to sack their head coach the following year, and they've got a ready made replacement there to move up. So it's always dangerous when it's you the are, old make make them the assistant, and then yeah. it's always dangerous yeah. when you're a head coach that performed poorly, and, and then they you bring have a, in, a star assistant yeah, coach. Uh, they bring in from another sudden. club. A star assistant that's ready to make the next. I mean, step. the other way of looking at it, John, is that you get a lot of help, but yeah. you sort of don't really look at it like that. If I was, <laughs> if I was the head coach of North Melbourne right now, I'd be like, oh god, they're bringing him in, and yeah. I mean, they always say the the coach gets gets final say or whatever, but you know, the club can always pressure him. Um, I'll tell you what, though, John, you talk about these long term AFL contracts. I've got another one for you: Western Bulldogs key forward Aaron Norton has re-signed with the club on a new eight-year deal. What the... He'll remain a Bulldog until the end of the 2032 season. He turns 24 next month. Um, some clubs were interested in him as a trade option, but obviously they're going to have to look elsewhere now, John. Um, so there speaking you go. of trades, uh, with West Coast and their... Um, eight years is ridiculous. I mean, it is, yeah. <laughs> Buddy being 10 years was long enough, but eight years is... is is still ridiculous, but um, I I I, I actually this was from a, a news source. So, with the whole bonuses that the West Coast are getting, they've got a bunch of bonuses this year, and then depending on how they go next year, they have extra bonuses in the draft. Mm. But the bonuses they have this year are tradable for things for next year, so they could actually pull off a big rot if they think they're not going to get their next year bonuses. They could actually really overly exploit this year's bonuses <laughs> as well. Yeah, that's again the trade, the the draft and the trade period and stuff like that can make yeah, these. I, know, the, uh, um, I think the trade period is coming up, isn't it, John? Yeah, it's uh, so, the, all the uh, next next week. The trade mm, period starts. Yeah. Draft finishes in November. Yep. But this we we said we always mention it like there's no perfect system and this kind of stuff is why the draft and the trade period and everything are not the perfect system either. It's not. I mean, when when players are signing seven year. $7 million deals and those deals haven't even come into effect yet and you're thinking about trading that player. So I wouldn't... I mean, you probably know it as well as anyone, John. It takes a while to sort of put a contract agreement together. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to be the person who went did all the legwork with that, um, that Clayton Oliver contract and then now all of a sudden it looks like he could be traded. All, all the negotiations what a waste and of stuff time. that go into it, the agency. Well, I'm sure the agent would be really Yeah, that's the thing. There's a lot that goes into it. He's on the agent's ongoing residual fees that he would have been getting for seven million. Because mm. one of the things that can happen is, he, well, one of the suggestions I've seen is he may not be able to go somewhere else for that much money. So even his agent will get less money than his original whatever he's going to get, like 10%, 20%. So maybe is it could, and we don't know. Could it be an issue if he's really not happy at the club and he wants out? You know, yes. sometimes players will put happiness above, you know, the money. and It could be. Um, Cause I mean, money's not an issue. A million dollars a year. One of the year. things, like, I always, I, I, you know, there's the, it happened in the NRL and I always wish it would, when you have a salary cap, 
the, there's I've seen floated before the idea that the organisation has to assign the values of the players actually where point systems as opposed to money is the more mm -hmm. evening out type system because you had things like that Israel Folau uh, was coming back and whoever it was I can't remember who it was was going to offer him like a hundred grand a year but like then five hundred thousand dollars in third party sponsors yeah, yeah. and the NRL it just rejected it and said <laughs> he's worth way more than that yeah. you can't go but then yeah. that was when it came out that Darren Lockyer had been on $200,000 at the Broncos for so many years. Yeah, I'm not Even sure. Though, yeah. I was like, why do you uh, let Broncos yeah. do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, red flag, yeah. anyone? Um, I did get, actually, I forgot, um, I did get some inside goss from an unnamed source that I can't give oh, really? about the Rabbitohs, actually. Oh, yeah, here that, we go. Um, even though Dimitri has been, it was funny, because I actually got it last week and I didn't... Um, didn't see it, but I saw like what it mentioned in that thing was that Jason Dimitri would be re-signed, but it's what it's while the Rabbitohs are negotiating with Sam Burgess to come back and take his place. Right. Um, okay. So they would re-sign him to keep everything stable. Yeah, yeah I mean, may, may, maybe it could be a case of South are just prepared to pay him out if they need yeah, to pay that's him. What it was, that was yeah. the, the yeah. like rumour that I heard from a source that I can't name, but it was that... It was funny when Dimitri re-signed. I forgot to write it down, but I, was, I thought about it when I saw the story because yeah. this source told me Jason Dimitri is going to be signed soon to create some stability, but South are currently doing a backdoor, trying to do a backdoor deal with um, Sam Burgess to come back and take over coaching. After where is he? Bradford Bulls. Um, was it Brad? Might have been. Might have been Warrington. John? Oh yeah, Warrington. It was Warrington. Warrington. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because he's got a two year deal there as well, and so yeah. Yeah. So first step of that 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 it's thing that I heard. It's is, funny that that Russell Crow Sam Burgess relationship. It's very mysterious, isn't it? Yeah. Like Russell hung up on him. Sam quits the club, but so, you know they're still. Sam Burgess said that to think they're still thick as thieves, and Sam Sam's Burgess said that he didn't hang up on him. Sam Burgess. Oh, so Sam Burgess has denied that. Yeah, has Sam he? Burgess right, said okay. that's not true. What actually happened was they said goodbye, and then Russell Crowe hung up. Hung up. It was, right, like, okay. it was a normal phone conversation, but it's it's yeah, yeah who knows? <laughs> no, well, it seems like there was something in that. Yeah, John, but only, anyway, you can only know when. Um, uh, what's it called? We're, the only people who really know are the people who are on the call. In that's true. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> so, you don't know for sure, but it was it was widely reported though. John. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but that could have been because there was three people in the room. One of them could have gone and told every newspaper reporter. True. Um, true. But, maybe it's just yeah. I just maybe I get a bit carried away with that sort of stuff. No, I, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know. It could have happened. And the Sambo just should just could just be covering it now and saying like. All right. Well. Okay, well, regardless of whether the phone call happened or not, the fact is Sam Burr just quit the Rabbitohs. Yes, um, and apparently he may be coming back. Yeah, so... <laughs> oh, to be the yeah, head I coach. Yeah, I wouldn't write it off happening, John. See, we'll see what happens next year. But the first step of this rumour that I heard <laughs> before it happened actually happened, so let's yeah. see. Very interesting times at Rabbitohs. Um, they're the other one that keeps going giving. Um, so do you want to go through the Cricket World Cup? Yeah, did you want me to, before we do go through all the teams, did you want me to just take you through that last warm-up game Australia played against Pakistan? At How did that happen? Yeah, it happened on Tuesday night just oh, after we... I totally we, forgot to look just, it up. It's all right, I've got notes here. Great. But um, <laughs> it happened just after we recorded on Tuesday, yeah. So, oh, speaking of which, just to mention, the YouTube of our uh, last week's podca last podcast is up now. We did have some yeah. technical difficulties due to producer John's... Um, Poor form. That's all right. That's all right. It happened. These things happen, John. These things happen. Okay. Um, Cricket World Cup warm up at Hyderabad. Australia made seven for three fifty one from their fifty overs. Glenn Maxwell top scored with seventy seven from seventy one balls, blasting six sixes. Cameron Green made fifty not out from forty balls as well. So good form from him. In reply, Pakistan were bowled out for 337 from 47.4 overs. Babar Azam top scored for Pakistan. Did making... you say just say 337? Um, yeah, bowled out for 337. So, yeah, they nearly got there. They, they gave it a good shake, didn't they? Far out. Um, yeah, Babar Azam, as I said, top scored for Pakistan, making 90 from 59 balls before retiring out like you would in the under-10s, John. I think that was because it was a warm-up game and he wanted to give some other players a bat. Um, Manus Labuschagne, John, of all people, was the best of the Australian bowlers with three for 78. By the best, I mean he took the most wickets. He yeah. did go for a lot of runs. 
So it looks as though maybe he might have a role to play with the ball at this World Cup as well, John. Well, they need it. Yeah, they do. They're short on bowling options. David Warner, I don't think he'll have a role with the ball, though, John. He rolled his arm over in this game and went for 41 from two overs. Australia won by 14 runs. As you said, though, John, Pakistan got close, didn't they? Pakistan we'll get to, but, like, I mean, Pakistan has been rather inconsistent uh, for the past few months, like through the Asia Cup and stuff like that as well. Not just in matches, like in overall like four matches, but in the middle of matches. <laughs> yeah. Like, they, yeah. They'll smash 337 and then get all out. Yeah. Like, it's They're bizarre. inconsistent within matches. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's unbelievable. That's going to be their weakness. But, yeah, so, um, well, that's good that we won. Uh, and it was good, good again, good yeah, batting. Yeah, now, yeah. It's good batting, like we've got good yeah, batting. So. Good score on the board. Um and they're and they're a decent side too, Pakistan. Yeah. So um, good form for the Aussie. Now, thankfully, all the warm ups and the preludes all out of the way, John. The main event kicks off tonight. England and New Zealand in the tournament opener on Thursday night, John. Yes. So it's tonight, seven thirty PM. Yes, yeah, so as um, I say, we're recording Thursday afternoon, games on Thursday night. Yeah. yeah. Um and so let's just go through each team. We'll leave Australia for last. Yeah. Um sure. So Afghanistan mm-hmm. uh, is yep. obviously there. There, I got some. They're ranked currently ranked ninth in the world, and the highest World Cup finish they've ever had is the group stages. Yeah, um, they lost every game at the twenty nineteen World Cup, John. Yeah, but a landmark World Cup win is long overdue. Um, interestingly, they're coached by former England batsman Jonathan Trott as well. Oh, okay, John. so they're paying one hundred and one dollars to win the um whole entire thing. Bet Although those odds are on SmartB, are they? SmartB.com.au, yes. yep. Bet Check with, it out for all your Cricket World Cup odds. And bet with your head not over it. Yep. Um, what if, we're, if we're going into it, yeah, like, like in the last World Cup, they almost beat India and Pakistan. They came close. Mm. But yeah, as you said, they've never won a... What, they didn't win any get any mm. matches, but they came close. And they are due for a win. Mm-hmm. And they're going to be odds, like they're going to be uh, have be the underdogs in every match. Mm. Probably with big odds on them. Yeah. So it might not be a bad... I don't want to say investment. Gambling is never an investment. It's <laughs> Sorry, what, what did you... I'm just wondering, what did you say they were ranked, John? Did you ninth. say... Ninth. Right, so the Netherlands, which we'll come to a bit later, they're ranked 14th. So if they were to play someone like that... Yeah. Well, they're going to play everyone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, um, yeah. So, yeah, right. you know, they're, pro- they're probably going to be play- paying things like... Four dollars, eight dollars, stuff like that. So it might not be a bad idea to chuck a sneaky ten on them every time they've got high odds. Absolutely, gamble responsibly. Yeah. Bet with your head, not over it. And then you might win one and make all your money back with a small profit. But mm. yeah, you know, uh, Afghanistan—they've got a uh, good spin attack. So they've got one of the best spin bowlers in the world, I believe, with Rashid Khan. Like, uh, yeah, he's, he's done very, very well in the BBL out here. Yeah, job. he's very, very good. Mm. Um, and he has been playing in a high quality tournament in the BBL. Mm. Um. But yeah, they pay one hundred and one dollars to win mm. the entire thing. They're not going to win. They probably won't make it out of the group stage. That's my prediction. Uh, but they may mm. win one match. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be. I mean, the top four teams make the semis. John, there's ten teams in it, so we yeah. know Afghanistan are not going to be in the yeah. top four. Of course, <laughs> they're not going to be. But for them, I think yeah, a good goal is to try and win one of their games. Yeah. I think if they could go away, get away with a win. They've they've had a good World Cup. They've got to play play nine matches, and they can they can if yeah. they can get one win from that, yeah. that's that's it. Uh, Bangladesh, okay, Bangladesh, yes, I've got a bit of news on Bangladesh for you, yeah. John. So legendary batsman Tamim Iqbal, he's controversially been left out of the squad, John. He's accused the Bangladesh Cricket Board of intentionally creating a tough environment for him in the days leading up to the squad announcement. Bangladesh's chief selector said Iqbal has been left out due to a back injury, but Iqbal is not happy, John. He said the board was, quote, creating one barrier after another. Oh. So that's well interesting. They've, they've, so they're ranked eighth uh, in ODI rankings, and the long, for highest they've ever gotten is to the quarterfinals. Um, they haven't played well for like three years, I think. They've been on a downward slide. They're also paying one hundred and one dollars to win the. It, it just, game. it just to me, it just feels like 
every time you think they're about to do something, they just take a few. Yeah. It's one step forward, two steps back with Bangladesh all the and time. And it seems to be a lot based on their upper management, their organisation, mm. and stuff like that. So yeah. maybe they need a management refactor to become a force again. Well, you know. I don't. Yeah, I don't think they were ever really yeah, one. But I, I well, know what you. Mean. But the, I mean, they've had their moments here and the, here or there, John. I remember that in it was two thousand and five in England where they beat Australia. Yeah. In an, so they have had their moments, but they just, again, they, they just haven't been able to, you know, consistently perform at a high level and, and, and therefore move up the world rankings in the tests and ODI. Yeah. They only won two matches in their uh, Asia Cup. And if you remember, one of them was against India, but that didn't matter to India because India was already through as one of the teams into the group of four in the Asia Cup. Um, and India still played really well in that, and mm-hmm. it seemed like they tape it off at the end and let Bangladesh kind of have one. It's like a Mabone, bro. <laughs> 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 you can have a win. Um, so, yeah, I don't... Kind of India, John. Very I don't fine. think India's... India's definitely not going to be in the top four uh, as oh, well. Oh, Bangladesh. Oh, sorry, Bangladesh yep, yep, yep. definitely not going to be in the yep. top four as well. They, they, Like I said, they're paying $101 to win. Um, so they're basically just another Afghanistan, according to the bookies and to me as well. Uh, I think they'll be lucky to win one match. It could be against Netherlands. Uh, no, maybe yeah, surely they'd want to beat the Netherlands. They'd want to beat Afghanistan. But that'd be it. I don't think they can beat Sri Lanka or South Africa, Pakistan, anyone else. Um, so as a minimum, they'd want wins over the Netherlands and Afghanistan. Yeah. That's an absolute minimum. That's that's a yep. that's a not a successful tournament. No, but so it's the bare minimum. When you go with Afghanistan, something like compared to Afghanistan, if Afghanistan wins one match, they've had a successful tournament. If yep. Bangladesh wins two, one against Afghanistan, one against Netherlands, they've had an expected tournament. Yep. So, it's so all, they need to win against someone else. It's all relative, isn't it, yeah, John? It's all exactly. relative. Always happens with the World Cups, but you know. Bangladesh, to have a successful tournament, need to show that they can actually be building to something and possibly, you know, beat Sri Lanka or something like mm. that. Um, England. Yep. England. So, ranked number 15 on the ODI rankings and the highest um, uh, finish is, of course, winner. Uh, yeah. They're paying $4.33 to win. There you go. We're getting, uh, we're getting into the heavyweights now, John. So, yeah, England defending champions, obviously. They won their first Cricket World Cup back in 2019 on home turf. They were world number one back then, but like you said, yeah. John, they're number five now. A lot of people have got them about second in the pecking order behind India. They're probably on about a par with Australia on that one, John. Um, and they've got the oldest squad in the tournament along with New Zealand yeah, too. Yeah, this will be their last chance to... A lot of the players' last chance to win a World Cup yep. uh, or another World Cup for some of them. Um, so it'd be after this tournament, you think there'll be an ODI rebuild for England, yeah. John? And their so their their batting is on they're on mm. fire right now. And from what I understand, all the all of their bowlers are carrying niggles, so they're not going to rely heavily on their attack. Mm. They're going to rely heavily on trying to aim for that five hundred uh, runs. Um, and yeah, I, I would and I the ex- bas ball. Yeah, yeah, I expect them scoring. to be in the final. To be honest, over Australia, that's my prediction okay. for them. Um, Maybe once we finish going through all the teams, we can go through our expected semi finalists. Yeah, yes, it yeah, might that's be a good idea. idea. Um, of course, India is next. We're going alphabetically, by the way. Yeah. ODI ranking number one. They've won before, of course. They're India. Yeah, clear favourites to win the tournament. They're yeah, hosting it. $2.75. There you go. Um, almost unbackable at that price, John. Yeah. Um, so they've got batsmen who can score double hundreds in ODIs, John, and a, a potent bowling attack that can just roll through teams. What about that route of um, Sri Lanka in the Asia Cup final yeah, all out for thing. 50? The reasons why they're so good right now is because they're in form, like absolutely in form. They're world number one and they're hosting, and there's nothing like an Indian crowd. I guess I've went, This is 2015 World Cup. I was at Australia versus yeah. India, and I've never, ever, ever seen... A home crowd like well, not a home crowd, a crowd it wasn't like a home that, crowd, yeah. and I can't imagine what yeah, it would be it like. Would. It they were so loud, scary, <laughs> but they left early. Interestingly, <laughs> though, John, India do have a poor record in knockout games, so that'll be something interesting to keep an eye on when uh, we get down to, to the, the last four business end of the tournament. I, for some reason, I don't think it's really going to be a problem for them this time, John. But you never know. So they last won in two thousand and eleven, so it's long overdue. <laughs> 
<laughs> and from Shubman Gill is currently aver- averaging 66 in ODIs as well. So he's he was one of the form players in the warm up games with against Australia and in the Asia Cup when he played. Um, yeah, I, I yes. Yeah. What can they're going to be hard to stop, yeah. John. Number one in the world for a reason. Mm. Um, then we got Netherlands, who are the feel good story. So Netherlands yeah. are paying five hundred and one dollars to win. Five hundred and one. Should I put a sneaky fiver on it, Tom? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's again betting isn't an investment. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and, uh, probably a very appropriate time to say bet with your head, not no. over it. <laughs> so they're they're ranked fourteenth in the world, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. And they're actually the feel good story of the competition. They managed to qualify in that qualifying tournament with a win over Scotland. Uh, who they were expected to get smashed by. And so they actually managed to pull it off. Um, so there's one player to watch for the Netherlands, which is Bas... a oh man, Dutch. Sure, right, do you want me to... Bas, Bas de Lied. Bas de Lied, yeah. Okay, so in that match uh, in against Scotland, he took five wickets and scored over 50. He's the first Netherlands cricket player to ever do that. Yep. And the first player to ever do it in a World Cup qualifier. Yeah, so he's right. their player to watch. I hope they get a win, to be honest. Yeah, I do too. I think just for them, just to qualify is an achievement in yeah, itself. Right? Exactly. Ranked 14th, and it's a 10-team tournament. They've done well just to yeah, be there. So job. if you look at all of the rankings, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, <laughs> 8, 9, 14th. <laughs> so the, there you go. The, the, the top all. nine uh, were expected to qualify, and in cricket, you really expect the top ten to qualify. But Netherlands was able to scrape. So through. well done on getting in. Yeah, Great achievement. Exactly. They've done well done. a lot for Netherlands cricket in that. Yeah. Um, the Kiwis, uh, they've never won. They rank sixth currently in ODIs, and as you said, they're the oldest team along with England. England. Yep. Um, their coach has coached. Two World Cup finals in his life. Won the T20 with the women's and won the men's Mm -hmm. and lost both. That is not a record that you want. Not really. Um, There had been runners-up at the last two World Cups, though, John, and I think you were there at the No, I wasn't actually at that. Sorry, Sorry, but they were in that one you're talking about, 2015. They did play Australia in the final. Australia and New Zealand were the hosts, and New Zealand were unbeatable at home because their um, fields are smaller. Mm. And so their, their fielding was their, their was much Yeah, they better. play at Eden Park where it's just yeah, a stone's throw when you've hit a six. Tiny, but their fielding is is very, very good for uh, balls go on the ground and mm. stuff like that. So that's how New Zealand managed to build up their ranking and become mm. really good, especially in that World Cup. They've been a very um, consistent team in World Cups, John. Um, they're the only team to make the semi-finals at the last four World Cups. And I don't think we can call them underrated anymore, John, because no. everybody calls them that. So if everybody calls them underratable, then they're not underrated uh, yeah. anymore. So they're, they're paying $9.50, yeah. which they... Uh, that is not... Well, it is, but it's not a bad bet, actually. That's that You're sort of getting in that value region at yeah. $9.50, I and reckon. This, these are obviously the odds now, and then odds will change a lot based so progressing. Mm-hmm. So... When you're looking at if you're going to play sneakies on now, look people who put I remember like people who put ten bucks on, I can't even remember who it was like Parramatta or something to, they were paying a hundred and one dollars once to win the grand NRL grand final when they made it in, um they lost to Melbourne in two thousand and nine two thousand and nine yeah yeah the so year if, Melbourne got if, done for if they had a, if they had a one look yeah. at what you would have done it's a sneaky yeah. tenner you know on these kind of yeah. odds but yeah don't bet on Netherlands but New Zealand you know they as you said they've been at every semi final. For the past four years, they've been in two finals, um, and they are like they're no longer underrated. They're one of the top. They are legitimately a top ten team, mm-hmm. and they can any of the top ten teams can potentially win it. So, yep. um, one thing about the New Zealand team is because America won't be watching it, um, so they won't get offended by the fact that they're called the Black Caps, like they did with <laughs> the Tall Blacks in the Basketball World yes. Cup. So we won't have any comedy on the news for that one. <laughs> Pakistan, ranked eighth in the world mm-hmm. right now. Yep. Oh, no, wait, number two. They're, pay- they're paying $8. They're ranked number two. Oh, right, yeah, sorry. Their previous mm-hmm. um, best World Cup finish ever, which we were just talking about off camera, was they won in 1992 against England in Australia. <laughs> um, so, yeah, these guys, they're all over the shop when it comes to cricket right now, actually. They're the most inconsistent team just continually. Yeah, um, well... 
I mean, there's plenty in the plus column for Pakistan, John. They got the number one batsman in the world in Baba Azam, who I was talking about earlier, made that 90 against yeah. Australia in the warm-up game from 59 balls. They got a very good bowling attack as well, despite the fact that Gunn, Paceman, Naseem Shah will miss the World Cup due to a shoulder injury, John. But, you know, Pakistan... They are a team who will be pushing for semi-finals, I think, John. Well, they're a, I find they're a coin flip. Mm. You know, flip a coin and then take take your bets. Cause, so the Asia Cup, obviously that's the last major major comp they were in. They dominated Nepal by 238 mm-hmm. runs. Then they beat up on Bangladesh by seven wickets. Mm. Okay? <laughs> With ten overs left. Mm. Then they got absolutely pumped by India and Sri Lanka. It's just... You just the, yeah, just flip a coin at the beginning of every match and go, are they going to win? Yeah. I've got to say, John, some of these... I'm starting to question maybe the, the methods around these um, world rankings. Yeah. <laughs> every time we say a team's got a good world ranking, we're talking about them having a bad recent tournament. Um, yeah. You know, I just don't know what methods they use for these rankings anyway. It, it, rankings it is a bit are the bizarre, rankings, right? John. Yeah. yeah, look at Australia. They're, what was Australia ranked number three? We'll get to them, but yeah, how do the hell are they still and ranked they, number and that, three? Well, that's the thing. They've lost, you know, they lost to in our ODI series to India recently, to South Africa as well. Uh, do, do they update these world rankings? Nah, not regularly? till after the <laughs> not till after the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> and it just screws up all of our, yeah. our guesswork. So South Africa, yep. South Africa, generally a good cricket team. They're uh, fourth in the world. Uh, their highest win, their highest place ever was semi finalists. Uh, they're currently paying eight dollars fifty. So they've never won a World Cup. Which when I looked this up, I was a little bit surprised about because they are a very good mm. cricket team or cricket yeah. nation. Yeah, as you said, they've never won a World Cup. I mean, they haven't even reached a final, John, which yeah. is a real surprise given um, you know their standing in the cricket world. They're notoriously bad in in big games, John, um, but they have scored quicker than any other team this year. So there you go. Heinrich Klaas, and he's certainly one to watch, John, scored 174 off 83 balls against Australia recently. Um, he's a very good hitter at the death, and those players are very handy in ODIs. I think he's one yeah. to watch out for, John. So they um, uh, they didn't actually get to do their warm-up against Afghanistan as well, so they had they lost lost out on one warm-up. I think it was... Um, washout. Would have been a washout. Yeah. There was bad weather around at that time. And then they got beat up by New Zealand. New Zealand put up a target of 321, but then it got dropped to 219 with the DLS, Duckworth... Duckworth-Lewis Lewis system. system. Yep. Um, South Africa only ended up losing by seven. So it's it's a little bit hard to say where their form is in their warm-ups. Mm. And then they had the... It was a, it was a test... Um, a series against Australia, yeah. So you can't really take that much away from that. Um, so I don't know where... So how oh, sorry, the South Africa one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, was they played ODIs against oh, okay, them cool. recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I don't really know where South Africa's at, and we'll see what happens with them. They're another one that can push really hard, can push really hard. It's not the fact that it's going to be a coin flip before the beginning of every match. It's kind of more of a coin flip for the overall tournament. Flip the coin at the beginning of the tournament, and if you get your heads, then South Africa's going to beat everyone. If you get tails, they'll probably go poorly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shrank is the last one before our, our favourites. Um, they're paying $41. They're currently ranked seventh in the world, and they have won before. Mm. Not for a long time, though, from what I understand. Like a long time. Um, they did make the Asia Cup final, but India dealt with them very severely in that game. Yeah, John, yeah. As we said, all out for 50 um, they're a strong bowling side, but they'll miss their sensational leg spinner, Wanindu Hasaranga, through injury. So that's yeah, that's they, a concern for Sri Lanka, John. They played well in the Asia Cup, but then when it when it really really mattered, they had their worst game of the past like twenty years. Mm. You know, and so that even if they were to make it to some of the like further down the um, even to the knockouts, mm. or if there's any clutch games. That we have to win this one, you got to worry for Sri Lanka. Um, 100%, John. So on to Australia, which is the one that everyone Aussies. cares about. Um, Australia's paying $4.50 to yep. win. They are the third favourites. Um, and their current ranking is third. So third favourites, third ranking. <laughs> I'm just going to say, before we chat on, do you want me to run, quickly run you through their 15-man squad? Yes, John? absolutely. Yeah, so Pat Cummins is captain. Steve Smith, Alex Carey and Josh Inglis are the two wicket keepers. Sean Abbott, Cameron Green, Josh Hazelwood, Travis Head, 
Manus Labuschagne, Mitch Marsh, Glenn Maxwell, Marcus Stoinis, David Warner, Adam Zampa, and Mitchell Stark, coached by Andrew McDonald. John. Mm. So these guys have won Australia. Well, Australia, us guys. It's all me. Um, <laughs> you got the jersey on. Exactly. Won four out of six of the last World Cups. Yeah, four of the last six World Cups. Yeah, they won five in total, the most of any country. Um, and India and the West Indies are the next best with two wins each. So what five for Australia, two for West Indies and India. So that just shows you how dominant yeah. Australia has been at this event, John. They won World Cups in 1987, 1999, 2003, 2007, and your one in 2015, John. The jersey says it all. Exactly. Um, that was a good, good series. But as we talked about, John, some patchy recent form, series defeats to South Africa and India last month. Mitch Marsh is looking solid at the top of the batting order, though, mm-hmm. John. Um, the squad's a bit light on bowling, though, particularly spin bowling. So Stark was the top... Mitchell Stark was the top wicket-taker in the 2019 and 2015 World Cup. So there you go. They're his only two World Cup appearances. He's taken 49 wickets at just 15 in World Cups. It's a phenomenal record. He's one yeah. to watch out for, for sure. So we know Nathan Lyon, obviously, who's the GOAT. He's out injured. Mitchell Stark is the guy that has to step mm. up and and lead the Aussie attack. Um, Glenn Maxwell had put up some good numbers in some of the recent matches uh, in bowling, not in batting. Um, I, I just say, John, on that Nathan Lyon, I don't think Nathan Lyon's been given enough of a look in in one day in a national cricket. I think if he's fit, you've got to pick him in yeah, the, so. the ODI side every time. I Adam agree. Zampa is nowhere near where Nathan Lyon is. But, and Nathan Lyon's currently injured. Oh yeah, yeah, he's injured. Yeah. He's I know he's injured, but I'm just saying, like in general, in history, yeah. in, in he, just historically, well, I don't he know. hasn't he I hasn't been given enough of a go in ODI. Cricket. He'd be the first player I would pick for my bowling for ODI or Test, no matter what. It's, yeah, like not penciled in. He's, yeah, I, he's yeah, pending. I know he's injured now, but I just don't think he's been given enough of a, an opportunity there. But yeah. anyway, that's a side note. But without someone like him in the, as you said, the bowling, it looks a bit like Mitchell Stark has got to do all the work. Glenn Maxwell has been playing bowling well. Um, I just want to I really hope that Glenn Maxwell is good with the bat because on his, on his given day, he's going to he's gonna do a lot for us. Well, they, they need him. They're going to need yeah. him. Um, you know, the, all of the top order has been going very well. Um, mm. And a lot of the bottom orders, is the bottom order, been going very well as well. It is tail enders. Tail yeah. end, yeah. <laughs> our, our bowling is, is where, where Australia will lose it if we lose it. If we don't go well, it'll all be around the bowling. Um, so he's hoping Mitchell Stark's in good form. Um, and as you said, his history at the World Cup is pretty impressive. Stella. So who's Stella your record. who's your four? Because the way it's okay. So mm. the way it works is every team will play every team. So it's mm-hmm. forty eight matches, and then the four at the top of the ladder will play a knockout comp for first, second, third, and fourth. Yeah. Um, so there will be a third place match as well. So it's. They each play each other, and then the losers play the losers, and the win- winners play the winners. Mm-hmm. So who do you think you're for? Um, so I'm going to go India will finish number one, John. Yep. Number two, I'm going to say England will finish number two. I'm going to have Australia at number three. Um, for number four is a toss-up for me between Pakistan and New Zealand. Um... I'm going to go for New Zealand, John. Mm. So, therefore, my semis would be one India v four New Zealand, and two England v three Australia. Well, I was going to go Netherlands will finish one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's that's pretty much right. Yeah, positioning, but I will have I would have South Africa at fourth. Okay, I yep. think so. I'm going to flip the coin at the, in my head at the beginning of the tournament and say I'll play so, say South Africa is going to play really really well, mm. and they'll they'll land fourth with New Zealand being close fifth and Pakistan being six 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 I can't add up, um, because yeah I just think Pakistan is too erratic to to perform consistently throughout. Yeah, that's that's what I've mentioned that New Zealand consistency the only team to make the semis at the World Cup in the last four World Cups. So that consistency just gives them the nod ahead of Pakistan yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, but I just think, yeah, it's, every streak has to come to an end. It's, uh, it's true. It's true. It could happen. Sometimes they you, never do. I guess you can only make your predictions based on what's happened in the past, can't you? Yeah. Um, so we'll be doing every Monday breakdown of the... So, okay, there's matches pretty much every single day. Yeah. Um, every podcast will be doing uh, a breakdown, so doing, won't we? Uh, 
previews, reviews and previews every podcast for the, I think it's to November. Tw- yes, yeah, mid to late November, I think it finishes. 20, 19th of November, maybe? Uh, yeah, I think Something it is. Something in that ballpark, I think, John. We'll just get the confirmation. It will be, yeah, as I said, so every, um, um, every podcast for the next six weeks will be mm. previews and reviews of all the matches. So every game of World Cup will be available to watch on Foxtel and KO, and KO so all the Foxtel streaming and KO streaming. And the Australia games will be available on the Nine Network and the Nine Now app. Now, when I say Nine Network, some of the matches will be on Channel Nine and some of them will be on Nine Go. So you can make sure you keep up to date on your television guide to find it. Yeah, just because um, it's not on the main channel doesn't mean they're not showing yeah. it. So make sure you check all the Channel 9 channels. Exactly. Every single, every single Australian match is being played on Channel 9. So if you think you can't find it, keep looking. They're yeah. all pretty much a 7.30pm start. Yeah. Just remember, Channel 9 will always show Married at First Sight over an Australian <laughs> cricket match. So bear that, bear that in mind, everybody. And every other channel will be playing Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But how long is that? So it'll be like five hours. It's five hours, right? The broadcast. Yeah, some so the the time difference. Something in that. I think most of the games, John, from what I gather, begin at seven thirty p.m. Sydney time. So the common sense thing for your Australian viewer of this tournament would be watch the first innings, finishes at eleven o'clock, go to bed. Yeah. That's your common sense viewing. Uh, unless you don't have to wake up for work. And yeah, yeah, in which case, him. stay up all night. And watch I think it. it's, yeah, India's currently five hours behind. Um, so, yeah, that's the Cricket World Cup. It's really exciting times. Uh, sport never sleeps. We're just going to do some quick touch on the Rugby World Cup because nothing yes. has happened. Um, we have to still wait for Fiji versus Portug- Portugal. Yeah, we did talk about it on uh, on Tuesday, John, but I can quickly run through the scenarios for the benefit yes. of our yeah, that was, uh, listeners it. and viewers. So that game's at 6am Monday, our time, Fiji v Portugal. All eyes will be on it. I don't know if mine will be at that time of the morning. I'll but, wake up and, but and we'll watch be, the end. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be checking out the result for sure, John. So Fiji win, they go through, obviously. Fiji lose, and they can still get a bonus point and therefore go through by scoring four or more tries or by losing by seven points or less. So Portugal would need to win by eight or more points and concede three tries or less for the Wallabies to go, to go through. through. Uh, current odds as of right now is Portugal started the week at $25, but have firmed to $12.50. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not yeah. going to win. Okay, so um, it's probably not worth getting up to watch the last 10 no, minutes as, of that. So. Well, I'll, pro- I'll probably watch the last 10 minutes because I have we'll, to wake up at that actually, time. Actually, we've got to wake up to come in and do this, don't yeah, we? So yeah, I may as well, uh, yeah. Um, as well. Fiji's paying $1.05. Um, hmm. you, you, as I said, all they have to do is win and they're through. Yeah, they that, don't, that's, that's they don't the even sim- have to try and win hard. You to know? simplify the scenario for Fiji supporters, just win the game. Yeah, and exactly, through. and they're through. So... Thank God, though, Rugby Australia has announced a review. <laughs> so it's the old get out line, John. When you're under the pump and you don't know what to say or what to do, you just say, oh, we'll, we'll do a review at the end of the tournament. And, and then you defer everything. You defer the criticism. You know, yeah, Rugby Australia is saved. They're doing a review. Um, I wonder who's going to do the review, John. Actually, to be honest, I don't care. I don't care either. No. I don't care. The review will do nothing. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go do the review. Like, what did you do wrong? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> done. <laughs> That's your review. We've done it for them. What are we going to save, save them the money, save what them are, the time. Okay, right, we're going to ask a few questions to make it make, <laughs> to get uh, to earn our millions of dollars that the review will get paid. What are you? Do, what are we doing wrong? Everything. What are we going to fix? Everything. <laughs> done. <laughs> Two million dollars, please. Yeah. <laughs> it's not rocket science. No, is it? it's yeah. No. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens on Monday on the Rugby World Cup. As I said the other day, you want to hope that Fiji lose, but actually I really hope that Fiji win just so they can teach Australian rugby a lesson um, in the end. I, I really hope that Australia gets knocked out and Australian rugby picks up. Australia would be very, very lucky to somehow get through here, John. I would hate And it. if they do get through, go and buy a million lottery, lotto tickets. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens and then... 
we'll stop talking about rugby union until New Zealand win. <laughs> 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 but Ireland is still my team. Um, Go so, Ireland. I'm so there is... Yeah. Um, okay. We touched on it the other day and I did some research on it. The Battle of the Battle Reef. On the, uh, uh, is it of the reef? On the reef. On the reef. On the, on reef. the reef. Battle of the Reef. Yeah, I had a bit of a look at the card there. John looks interesting. Um, so there's a... The, the headliner is not Justin Hodges and Matt Cooper. The poster just makes it look like, look like it is. <laughs> Which is another stupid thing about boxing, right? Okay. Yeah. The headliner is actually uh, Paulo Acuso versus Gabriel Char Diaz. For does, the... that, does that frustrate you as a, as a fighting enthusiast that you are? Does it frustrate you that they use um, Hodges full and washed up rugby league players to sell a legitimate bout between Acuso and yeah. So it's, they're fighting for the actual... and they say, Look, okay, this also frustrates me. They're mm-hmm. fighting for the IBO Intercontinental Light Heavyweight title, which is one of like 700 boxing titles. <laughs> Let it all out, John. Vent it all. <laughs> this could, it all this could have been the opening ca- fight of the card either way, okay? <laughs> Wouldn't have made a difference. Really, I think boxing, you're better off just going for the circus matches, which is Matt Cooper versus Justin Hodges, <laughs> yeah. because nobody cares about this headliner so much so they didn't even... They're a footnote on the poster. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see the steam coming off. Because of the these door. idiotic titles, okay? <laughs> so just for these guys, uh, like I'm going to go for Akuso because he's from Australia. He's from Mount mm-hmm. Druitt. He's undefeated in five fights. So cool. Um, Diaz is from Argentina. He has way more experience. He's 14 and 5. He has been DQ'd twice in his career, which makes him kind of a dirty fighter. Um I'm not going to buy the pay-per-view for this. I'm not actually going to watch it at all because the pay-per-view, which is another thing I really want, it's $50. $50 for a pay-per-view on stand. Absolutely ridiculous. I can pay $60 for a UFC card. Why am I paying $50 for this? Yeah, exactly. Um, but there are that's some... the thing. You're, gonna, you, you're wiping out a lot of potential viewers, you know, people who would have watched if it was for free, but they're not going to pay $50 no, to watch it. They should have just chucked it on stand, to be honest. There is a cost of living crisis. People yeah. don't just have $50 lying around anymore. They Joel. should have just chucked it on stand, and people who pay their $13 a month for stand sport could have watched it, and heaps of people would have watched it, because there are some interesting fights on the card, right? Yes. So I go through them all, because there's only five fights, six fights. Mm. The card's going to open with Junior Paulo versus Ben Hennon. Junior Paulo is a current NRL player. Ben Hennon is a retired. Yeah. Young man beating up a old man. Cool. So who who do you reckon will win that one? I think um, Junior Paulo. Right. Um, so yeah. both of the interesting thing about this just so for some trivia is both of these guys have been beat by Paul Gallen. So Junior Paulo got go. knocked out by him. Uh, ben Hannon has got um, lost to Gallen by decision. Ben Hannon also mm-hmm. lost to Hodges by decision. So Ben Hannon is zero and two. Junior Paulo is zero and one. <laughs> so someone's going to get their first win. Yes. <laughs> um, then we've got uh, Tavita Pengai Jr., your man, uh, versus Frank Amato. So TPJ, yeah, go. he's done some had some fights before. Mm-hmm. He's actually 2-0 and with two KOs. Uh, he did one in 2021 uh, and one in 2022. He was on the Sonny Bill Mark Hunt card that Sonny Bill beat up Mark Hunt, another younger person beating up an older person. Mm-hmm. Um Amato is one on one, but he, like I think TPJ is going to beat the crap out of the poor guy, and that's another thing I hate about boxing because in boxing it's it's good but it's also bad is they feed people cans to pad their record. So Amato mm. he fought in two thousand and seventeen and two thousand and twenty two. That's his only professional fight. Now he may be off fighting amateurs and stuff like that, which obviously mm. you don't get a record for and mm. all that kind of stuff. Mm. And then he's fighting TPJ, who's young, who's uh, fought twice in two years, KO'd both of those people, and it's this is probably just to pad TPJ's record, so then he can start earning that money because yeah, he'll probably be on like twelve and twelve, twelve show twelve win. So get that thing, and he'll start going looking for those millions. So what they give him an easy fight just to yeah. Uh, Anthony Mundine, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that good promoters do, though... I like Mundine, though, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. One of the things good promoters do, which I don't know who the promoter is for this fight, good promoters do is when they have someone like TPJ who wants to become a boxer, they'll take him to the gym and their coach will say, so uh, Tavita's um, defence on his right side is a little bit poor. Mm. So then a good promoter will go find a lower quality fighter who has okay right side attack 
and then mm. put him up against uh, that person to give him a bit of experience in that, to build them up, not only by patting their record, but actually building up their ability to box. Yeah. So it's one of the good things about this can fighting and boxing. So, but John, just, if TPJ wins this fight, what does he get paid again? 15 grand? No, I'm, I'm guessing. I can only guess. The um, purses will come out afterwards, but I'd say he might be on like a 12, 12 grand to show. Uh, just to turn up. As soon as the bell rings, he gets his twelve grand. And then if he wins, another twelve. So it's not like... quite seven hundred and fifty grand yes. to play rugby league. But anyway. And then you know, in boxing, you can only really do like two fights a year, right? So because and the, that's the other problem, commissions right? will suspend you after a fight if you get hit too many times for six months. Yeah. yeah so, so it does yeah. feel like there was more to that TPJ for departure sure. than meets the eye. Yeah, you ain't walking anyway. in, a, in here on a three fifty, three fifty. No way. His second fight on a card. I know, this nonsense card. So yeah. after that, we've got Tamalolo versus... Uh, Ricky Campbell Killer. That's going to be legit. Uh, I can't wait for this one. So who's going to get... Who's going to win that Couldn't one, possibly say. They're Don't both know. debuts. Okay, um, but it'll be interesting. So last time I watched a rugby league debut, like two two fighters fight... Two mm-hmm. players fight each other was Todd Carney versus Chris Sando. <laughs> <laughs> in 2016. That was the last time I watched, right? And if you've ever watched that Simpsons episode where Bart's like, I'm going to go like this, and if you get hit, you'll go to your fault. And Lisa goes, well, I'm going to go like this, and if you get hit, <laughs> that's what Carney versus Sando was. <laughs> the difference is Carney and Sando are like... It's what they they were like seventy kilos, yeah. whereas um, Tom Alolo versus Campbell Gillard are two big men. So if they just walk forward into each other's bombs, one of them's probably going to get knocked out. So it'll be a cool one. Be interesting. Um, then after that, there's uh, Nelson Asafa Salomona versus Jared Wallace. Mm-hmm. So Nelson Asafa Salomona is making his debut. I have no idea if he can box. Okay. But Jared Wallace, he actually is. Pretty good boxer. He's fought before. Okay. He um, beat Nick Timms. Um, so I'm guessing you'd be tipping Wallace to win that one, yeah, given, that so. you don't, given that the unknown with a sofa Solomon. So I think uh, the fight with Jared Wallace and Nick Timms wasn't classed as a professional bout. Right. It was on the yeah. Monday versus John Wayne Park card. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think Jared Wallace is going to get this one. Yep. And then co main event, you got Hodges versus Matt Cooper. Um, Hodges is 5 and 3. But has been mm-hmm. beaten twice. His last two that he was beat by was Paul Gallon, a TKO, a TKO and a decision. He also got beat up by Darcy Lussick in 2019. Again, young men beating up an old man. Mm-hmm. Now, Hodges is younger than me, but this is boxing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to walk into a boxing ring against 26-year-old Darcy Lussick. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to hand it to him. He's yeah. got uh, some you-know-whats on him, John. So, Matty Cooper looks fit as so Matty Cooper's debut he's never boxed before he looks fit as and I saw some training video and he looks slick but Justin Hodges has the experience and Justin Hodges looks big like really really big so what's your gut feel on this one John? I think Hodges will win because of experience okay. uh, probably by decision because mm. uh, Matt Cooper has always been fit and strong um, mm. and yeah I think Hodges is just Experience in boxing, boxing especially. What people don't understand about the difference between boxing and things like MMA is when you watch MMA with someone and you introduce it to, to someone and they like, I always have this, they'll go like, how do you think they'll go in a real fight? And I go, <laughs> like that. <laughs> like, they're going to tackle you to the ground, mount you and punch the crap out of you. <laughs> but in boxing, I wonder how they go in a real fight. They're not going to box because boxing is... Very tactical, very strategic. It's a beautiful thing to watch when there's good boxing. Um, I've had people mock boxing, like MMA fans that I know mock boxing, and I always tell them, mm. you should go watch you know, the classics, Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, mm. and then come back to me and tell me boxing isn't so, it. So do you, of, between boxing and UFC, John, what do you prefer? I much prefer MMA. Right, yeah. And it's because with all of the MMA, or there's only a few MMA organisations, mm. and all of them try as hard as they can to put on a high-quality card. Right. So the whole day is really like... On a, on a UFC numbered day, like a pay-per-view, I'll off, it starts at 8 a.m. I'll be up at 8 a.m. and I'll often have friends come to my house from like 8, 9, 10 a.m. and watch all of the cards. Whereas in boxing, you'll have a intercontinental light IBO heavyweight title between two guys that one of them's had five fights before and it's a main fight but he's on like the like he's a footnote on the poster versus two football players and then yeah like 
you'll have things where the main event will be getting paid like literally $50 million and then the co-main event will be getting paid $25,000. So the, yeah, like a, I think boxing as an, boxing as an organization is also really suspect like money from a money laundering perspective, like, <laughs> just, just really a little bit, really drunk, just a bit. <laughs> so that's why I, that's, but that's why I prefer MMA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. good boxing, I really mm-hmm. love to watch. Mm-hmm. Like I really love it. So some of those prime, like Anthony Mundine versus Danny Green, was amazing. It was. Watch it anything was Floyd Mayweather huge. does. Uh, a lot of people bag Floyd Mayweather because when he was getting on later in his career, the other one of the other things about boxing versus MMA is in MMA. And especially in things like the UFC, the UFC tells you who you're going to fight, you fight them. Mm. That's it. If you don't, if you say no, your contract gets extended by six months and they screw your life. <laughs> in boxing, the champs usually get to pick who they fight. So there's criticisms of Floyd Mayweather, for example. Like he's 52-0, and 0, you know. Mm. That later on in his career, he started to pick cans to pad his record mm. because he's getting older. Yeah. And now he's beaten up like Thai kickboxers that are half his size. Mm. But he did beat up Logan Paul, who's like twice his size. Yeah. So Floyd Mayweather is still a beautiful thing to watch. What he did to Conor McGregor was amazing. You know, he slipped for nine rounds, avoided. There was. In that Conor McGregor Floyd Mayweather fight, I had Conor winning two rounds. I think it was the second and third. Mm. Conor McGregor put it on Floyd Mayweather but then Floyd Mayweather adjusted and every time Conor would get close Floyd would give up his back and Conor would grab and that's a clinch and you have to break up it's like tactical like Mm. boxing is like chess man when you're Mm. really good at it and then when he could see Conor was Conor lowered his hands just slightly Mm. and opened up his head and then Floyd put it on his head and gave him TKO he knew like it was like Floyd went I can finish this fight here and just did so, yeah, good boxing is amazing. But yep. the problem with boxing is it's so few and far between. Like, I won't yeah. watch this at all. Like, yeah. I just won't. Yeah. I'll watch some Instagram highlights and stuff like mm. that. I'll watch, boxing um, needs some more superstars. Yeah. Maybe. I'll watch um, Tom Lala and Rig and Campbell Gillard throw handbags at each other. <laughs> <laughs> Do slap fights or something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. But $50 pay-per-view on stand is absolutely the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Five fights. Yeah, ridiculous. Um, you know, you got to be realistic. People yeah. are watching what they spend these days. They're not going to spend fifty dollars on a fight card yeah. like that. Yeah, definitely not. Um, um, I've got something here for you, John. Yes, definitely. Tennis related. Yes, I love tennis, Ben. Another one of my little tennis, tennis updates at the end here. I love wee tennis. <laughs> so, um, John Aussie Mark. Holmans. He's ranked 140 in the world. He was playing against Italian Stefano Napolitano in qualifying for the Shanghai Masters 1000 event. Polmans was leading the match 7-6, 6 all, 6-5 in the tiebreaker. So he had match point when this incident occurred. Polmans mishit a backhand drop shot and then in frustration smashed a ball into the umpire's face. Oh, God. Um, so under the rules, an action, that, an action that threatens the safety of officials can result in immediate disqualification. That's what happened to Polman's John. He was disqualified, banished from the event. Um, if Polman's had have won that match, he would have gained entry into the main draw of the tournament. That's not to be, obviously, John. Instead, as a consequence of his actions, he'll get no prize money, nor should he, even though he won his first match in qualifying. Interestingly, Nick Kyrgios said this, John, in, in reference to this incident. Oh, Nick. Interested yeah. to see what the fine will be, all things considered, in brackets, £15,000 for the bottle shake at Queen's. Now, that was when Nick Kyrgios was fined £15,000 for a bottle shake at Queen's um, in an incident that occurred at that Queen's tournament back in 2018. Um, I don't need to tell you about the manner that Nick Kyrgios was shaking the water bottle in, John. I think you can work that one out for yourself. Um, And, of course, John Novak Djokovic, in an incident similar, though not as bad as this, was defaulted during the fourth round of the 2020 US Open for hitting a ball into a lineswoman's throat. Yeah, so the Novak Djokovic one, uh, uh, that's more comparable to Nick Kyrgios. um... Yeah, it it, it was a tap. Djokovic yeah. tapped the ball, it, it hit the linesman's throat, the linesman went down like they'd been shot, lineswoman I should say, went down like she'd been shot by a sniper or something, which yeah. really didn't happen, 
But anyway, the rules are the rules. Djokovic yep. was disqualified. Yeah, was... But Pullman's absolutely belted the ball and it's hit yeah, the umpire. Yeah, they should do that. I know there's a lot, man. I, I talked about it before. Like, tennis is... It's... People need to understand tenor, tennis is a super high-pressure situation. It more akin to combat sports than anything else. It's basically when you go onto that tennis court, you, the cage is locking behind you and it's just you and you and yeah. your opponent. That's it. Yeah. It's quiet, mm. so it's even worse. <laughs> yeah. And you can have things where there'll be like a 29-ball rally mm. and then uh, like anything can happen, you know, and it can be super frustrating, but... All that aside, doesn't matter how high pressure it is, you do not smash the ball in frustration because of the danger. Like, mm. this is the kind of thing you learn from Djokovic. It even happened to Djokovic. Djokovic is, like, obviously second greatest of all time after Roger Federer. Oh, okay, That's, uh, that, we will have that debate another day, John. Um, um, third greatest after Rafael Nadal. Um, and and they, they, they stuck to the rules with him. And so, you know, you would hope that he has learned, like... Obviously, it hasn't happened again since then. And you would, you would think that all players should take from that. No matter who you are, if you hit the ball and it hits one of the officials, you are DQ'd and you're an idiot. And I think, I've got to be honest, I think the way it happened, he's absolutely belted the ball, hit the umpire. Again, this was not part of the, the point. It had already been completed. This is purely an act of frustration outside of the point, you know, outside of the, the rally. He's just hit a ball in frustration at the umpire. John, I think he should be banned for 12 months. Yeah, and that'll give him a good time to think like, about what he's done. I haven't seen it. I didn't even know it happened. I, I Having seen it, I think he should be banned for but 12 months. If you say it like I agree, because it's not something any tennis player ever should do. No. I know there is a lot of pressure in tennis. Like I've never played tennis professionally, obviously. But you can, like, people people really need to understand there's way more pressure in something like tennis than in something like rugby league or AFL, actually, on an individual basis. But it doesn't matter how much pressure there is, you cannot do silly things like that. You just can't. That's right. it's absolutely, you can't. Um, um, John, is there one little other thing I could add, um, just from a bit earlier in our show today, um, I just wanted to add a little bit more on that Latrell Mitchell stuff yeah. we were talking about. So... So Mal Meninga was quoted as saying, this is in regard to this Latrell Mitchell um, issue. He said, and I quote uh, Mal Meninga, a little bit disappointed that the South Sydney club gave him permission to play when they didn't give him permission to play for the Aussies, Meninga said. Now, after that, new, the news came to light. Latrell took to Instagram to clarify his position and he said the following, I play for my country because I love it. It's not my time to put the jersey on this year. It's for someone that deserves the crack. Bradman Best or Hamaso Tabio Fado, I will be back. Curry knockout was to simply give back to so many that deserve it. I love my culture and my people. Don't get it twisted. It's the don't get it twisted that it just gets to me, John. But pe- people are going to question this Latrell. They're going to question it. I'm sorry, but if, you, if you're out with a finger injury from the kangaroo squad and you go and play in another tournament... People are going to question it. That's not them getting it twisted. That's just them looking at the facts. Well, that's uh, uh, preempting, you know, to try and make it not about what yeah, he's it is actually it. about. Yeah, he's spinning it. He's spinning it, you know. So he's just preempting that. Oh, it's going to become a, a anti Latrell Latrell bullying kind of thing. And, that, and that's what I was talking about earlier. So I just wanted to yeah, so to add a bit more on that issue and, and clear so that don't, up. Don't, like, as I said before, he just shouldn't have done it. <laughs> he's, it's, it's like he's hit the ball into an umpire's face, you know. Like just, you just don't do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's, uh, uh, we do have some some awesome yeah. news. So Ollie Silverton, who is our man on the ground uh, at the World Cup, and he was at the Ryder Cup. You might have seen some videos at the Ryder Cup um, on our Instagram. He's also appearing on the Club Prairie Fire podcast, and we're excited to announce that we're partnering to sponsor their podcast. So that's with Adam Gilchrist, Michael Vaughan, and James the Professor Rochford. Awesome. Um, Smart will be featured on there, and if you want to check it out, if you want more cricket content, they're breaking down the World Cup. They've just today uploaded, so today is... Thursday. Thursday. Thursday uploaded their, their episode with their World Cup previews. So watch that. Check out if you can uh, compare how good we are as experts compared to guys like Gilly. Then you'll know if we, you'll be able to compare if we know what we're talking about. 
But everything we say is an opinion, so opinions can't be wrong. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so that's a really cool thing. Check it yeah. out. It's the Prairie Prairie Fire Podcast. No, Club Prairie Fire yeah. Podcast. Good news, John. It's on uh, YouTube, Instagram, everything. Nice one. Cool. Well done. Yep. So we'll see everybody on Monday. Uh, to make fun of Australia getting knocked out of the World Cup. Yeah, <laughs> the Rugby World Cup, that yeah, is. Yeah, Rugby Not World the Cup. Cricket World Cup. That's um, only and just starting. to discuss the matches Australia, playing, Australia is playing on Sunday in the Cricket World Cup, which we're very excited for. I may actually stay up to watch the whole match, but I am old and I do fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> do your best, John. Yeah, so see you guys on Monday, and don't forget to go to smartbee.com.au for all your sports news. Follow us on social at smartbeeapp, and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks, John. See you. Thanks, Dan.